Searsport District High School to present you with the information we collected and analyzed through our soft shell clam experiment with Dr. Beal. He's a professor at the University of Maine Machias and a scientist at the Down East Institute of Maine Research Center. The goal was to work with real scientists, help collect data in an experiment, and analyze and present the data to the soft shell clam committees of Searsport and Stockton Springs. This experiment was done by all the high school science classes and led by three science teachers, Mrs. S.K., Mrs. Gussie, and Ms. Colbury. We would like to thank you for your time, and without further ado, here's Amelia Law and Isaiah Terrio speaking on soft shell clam and Dr. Beer. Hello, I'm Amelia, and this is Isaiah. We are ninth grade students, and we will be discussing the life cycle of the soft shell clam along with who we worked with on this project. In this project, we worked with Dr. Beal, who is a professor of marine ecology at the University of Maine Machias. He has worked with lobstermen and shellfish committees to create the very first public clam hatchery in Maine, which is known as the Beal Island Regional Shellfish Hatchery. He is very well known in the eastern U.S. and Canada for his work with soft-shelled clams and other shellfish, shellfish species. He came to our school looking to work with high school students on a project involving clam research, and of course we accepted, as it gave us an opportunity to do hands-on science and real research. This project combined his interest in ecology and mariculture, along with our school's interest in marine life. Sorry, we're having technical difficulties. That's because whenever you make presentations, it always happens. <laughs> this is the full experience for you guys. <laughs> All right, let's see. So we got Comment. Somebody said it's all uncomfortable. <laughs> they share your feelings sometimes. Shell clam starts when mature adult clams release sperm and eggs into the water, resulting in fertilization. Over the next few weeks, the clams go through several different stages. One of the most important is the pedivelager stage, when the clam develops a shell, stops swimming, and drops to the ocean floor. The wild clams that were found in the recruitment boxes enter at this stage. The green crabs prey on the clams during the juvenile stage, while the milky ribbon worms attack throughout all the stages. By the time the clam is one to two years old, it is mature, thus restarting the cycle. So what's next in this process is the procedures we follow. The first thing that happened is Dr. Beale presented our, to our school asking us to participate in, our science, in his science experiment. After he presented to us, we started constructing boxes, as you can see in the photo. Once we constructed boxes and ground netted pots, we placed 12 seed clams inside each pot. Then we inserted the pots at three different locations, Sears Island West, Sears Island East, and Cape Jellison. Then we waited 143 days to come back and collect the specimens. Then students and teachers returned to each site and retrieved the pots and boxes. We returned to the school with the pots and boxes and washed the specimens. This is one of the fo fully grown hatchery clams that were put in the pot. Um, then we counted and recorded all the specimens. Like. <laughs> 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 and then Dr. Gary returned to the school and we shared what we learned with him. So we made all of these posters to represent the predators on the three sites we worked at. So and the layout. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> speak up then, you have to speak up. The netted pots are represented by the crisscross pattern on here. I'll give you can see it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with the data from Sears Island East. Uh, we found the most 
most predators were in the boxes in the site, which are these things. There were only three predators in the pots in the mid intertidal zone. So this up here is mid intertidal zone. There were only three predators in the pots. Um, and there were 11 predators in the low intertidal zone pots. Uh, all the predators that we found in the pots were crabs. We only found two milky ribbon worms in the pots, and they were in the boxes. They were both in low box five right here, two milky ribbon worms. In Sears Island West, we didn't find any predators in boxes, which was surprising. And like in Sears Island East, there were more predators in the lower intertidal zones, specifically six in the mid intertidal and 15 in the lower intertidal. Most of them were crabs. Um, yeah. Both Sears Island East and Sears Island West were very rocky, solid terrain. Um, it did not have a ton of crabs and a ton of predators. However, the very muddy Cape Jellison had an extremely high density of clams and predators. There was a grand total of 166.5 predators in Cape Jellison. <laughs> found half a milky ribbon worm. Uh, <laughs> the majority of the predators in this site were found in the boxes. And yeah, that's Cape Jellison. So we found that the netting in all three of these sites, it didn't really make a difference in the predators getting in and eating the clams uh, because the milky ribbon worm could fit through using pretty big netting. Um, and most of the predators that we found all three sites were in the low intertidal zone, which makes sense because get more water coverage. And Cape Jellison had the most predators. Thank you. <laughs> In total, in the pots, we put out uh, 144 hatchery clams. So this one went in the pot you see there. And the 1,440 1, clams we put out, we collected only 85 ones that were alive at the end of this. So that means out of all the clams we put out, only 5.9% lived. And out of the 85 that survived, uh, 47 of these clams were collected from uh, Cape Jellison. Uh, so in the sites, we also put out uh, recruitment boxes, which are... Oh. <laughs> that box right there. Um, uh, the recruitment boxes are two square feet, built out of furring strips and louts, uh, and they're covered in pet screen. And these boxes are designed uh, to collect um, native clams when they're young, they go up in there. And uh, we laid out uh, 12 boxes in each site, uh, 6 at the mid-tide zone and 6 at the low-tide zone. Uh, so the first site we have here is uh, Searsport, uh, Sears Island East. So um, uh, the, mo the largest box at the mid-tide at Sears Island East had uh, 1,456 clams, and the box with the least amount at Sears Island uh, East Mid uh, had 345, and at low, uh, the largest one was 679, and the smallest was 256. So we have Sears, Sears Island West, and the largest at Sears Island uh, West uh, mid-tide uh, was 830, and the smallest was 248. Uh, and at low-tide, the largest was uh, 472, and the smallest was 87. So then, uh, moving on to Cape Jellison, which was uh, the muddiest site, there was a bit different results. So at Cape Jellison um, mid, uh, the largest amount of clams was 1,631, and the smallest was 787. And at low tide, the largest was uh, 1,781, and the smallest was 1,053. Uh, there was much more clams found in Cape Jellison than the other sites. And then this is the average number of clams uh, per site. So uh, the average number of clams at Seasford East Mid was 404.5, and at low it was uh, 227.8. The average at Seasport West was uh, 664.6, .6, 
uh, and that was the mid. And then the low was 469.8, and the average Cape Jellison uh, mid was uh, um, 1,317, and the average at low was 1,341.2. And then we just have, this here is the total graph. Um, uh, looking at the average and the total lefts, you can clearly see that Cape Jellison had vastly more clams than either of the other sites. So, yeah. um, so I, look, I also looked at the number of claims. Thank you. <laughs> and I looked at the distribution of them and um, just sort of analyzing it, the clam amount in the boxes versus the pots, Sears Island sites versus the uh, Stockton Springs Cape Jellison site. And lastly, the tide zone that they were in, the mid-tide zone, the low-tide zone. And I used box and whisker plots to do that, and they're kind of a funky graph. <laughs> All right. So you can see um, four boxes, and each of the boxes stands for a certain sort of setting that the claims are in. And they're labeled LB, LP, MPMB. And that's for low box, low pot, mid pot, and mid box. And so um, these are all at the Sears Island East site. Oh, I do it always well, a Fancy. All right. So this would be the box in the low um, intertidal zone at the Sears Island East site. And this is a collection of all the, all the um, data from each of the boxes. It's clam density per 10 centimeters squared. And so here's a median. That line in the middle is a median of all the low boxes at Sears Island East. And then minimum, maximum, and we have a few outliers, but there aren't many. Um, and then the interquartile zones are just halfway in between the median and the minimum, and halfway in between the median and the maximum. And so that's the same for each different setting, a box or a pot in the low intertidal zone or the mid-intertidal zone. Um, so that's how the graphs work. I did that for each site, Sears Island East and Sears Island West and Cape Jellison. Um, comparing pots and boxes, you can see through Sears Island East, West, and Cape Jellison. It's much more noticeable in Cape Jellison, so I'll stick here. But the boxes had a much higher clam density than the pots did. Um, and that was consistent through all three sites. It just it's very much more noticeable at Cape Jellison. And so the reason that we think it is more noticeable is because Cape Jellison had a lot more mud. It was much um, more supportive to life. And so it's just that difference was allowed to show in the data more. But the boxes had a smaller mesh, and so that's that's the real reason that this happens. We think is that. A smaller mesh just means that less predators can get in, but um, the, the less predators can get in, more clams can thrive and survive. And so then, so boxes have more clams than pots do. Um, comparing the two different sites, as far as clam density, again, Haight Gillison is more life supporting. Over here, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see there's about 13 clams per 10 centimeters squared. And if you look at the other two sites, they stay around the, uh, like, six at the highest. I think that might be on the other site. There it is. Around six at a maximum, which is almost, or more than half as much as the um, clams at Cape Jellison. So that muddy terrain really let the clams thrive more. Um, as far as comparing the intertidal zones with the lows versus the mids, there isn't too much of a difference. Um, mid pot versus low pot. Let me find the right graph here. The difference, we conclude the difference was between the boxes, because if you compare Um, I'm sorry. There, if you compare the two, 
if you compare the two graphs, it isn't that much of a difference, and it does vary throughout all three graphs, and so we decided that that was inconclusive. Um, so the real factor that we found was the mud in the terrain at Cape Jellison, and the smaller mesh size on the boxes prevented um, predators from getting in, and so the clams could thrive more in the boxes and more in muddier terrains like Cape Jellison. All right, so now that we've shared all of the specific clam data with you, let's now talk about the main problem behind it, and obviously I'm sure you figured out by now it's predation. The two main predators found at the three experimental sites, Sears Island East, Sears Island West, and Cape Jellison, were milky ribbon worms and green crabs. To start off with the milky ribbon worms, you should probably know a little about their background. The milky ribbon worm is a marine worm that is a milky white color that also may be considered pinkish. They are able to grow up to 48 inches. Milky ribbon worms can be found anywhere along the Atlantic coastline. They prefer to live in sandy beaches and low intertidal mud flats. Milky ribbon worms feed on crustaceans and bivalve mollusks such as softshell clams. Unfortunately, not, not as much information about milky ribbon worms is known compared to other predators, but we do know that one of the main components to them having as much of an influence on the softshell clam population as they do is their long sticky proboscis, which is like a tongue, sort of. Um, they eat the clams by extending their proboscis through the grooved underside of the clam's head, giving them an advantage compared to most predators. To start off with the green crab, they learned they in, early, in the early 1900s, green crabs started to spread northwards and arrived in May in the 1950s. The, dor the dorsal shell of a green crab, surprisingly, is not always green. It can be either dark brown or dark green and may contain yellowish patches. The ventral or underside shell can be either green, red, or orange, and in, and in adult green crabs, typical length is two and a half inches, but the length can be up to four inches. Green crabs prey on mollusks, crustaceans, polychaetes, and green algae. One green crab can consume around 40 half inch clams a day, which is quite a bit consuming, considering how many green crabs there are in total. Green crabs also have the ability to learn and improve prey handling skills, which doesn't really give their prey many advantages. Green crabs are also more quicker, more dexterous, which means skills with the hands, and can open shells in more, more ways than other species of crab, making them more of a threat. Some of the ways to protect clams or other prey from green crabs are trapping, monitoring, fencing, chemical methods, and fisheries. Mesh nets also help with protection, but do not completely conceal the prey, because green crabs are known to break through the, those mesh nets. With our experiment at Sears Island East, Sears Island West, and Cape Jellison, in both Cape Jellison and Sears Island East, more green crabs were found in the pots with mesh netting over them than those pots without mesh netting, which is very surprising. In conclusion, during this experiment, more damage was caused by the milky ribbon worm than the green crab. Thank you. And then feel free to ask any questions if you have for any of us. So really quick, I have to present a bibliography because I have to present our sources so we don't plagiarize. And <laughs> found more green crabs in the boxes that were netted than the ones that weren't netted? I think that's what you're saying? Well, it kind of depends on the placement where the mesh netting and uh, the non-mesh netting was like, placed throughout the site. So I think that has like a big factor, but that's also like can't be like known per se because it's kind of like depending on where the green crabs just come across first because they're just going to see clams and then go for their prey quicker because that is part of their, um, the way they hunt and that's like part of their, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, it might have possible, it might have been because they float in when they're very little and they grow and they eat the, the clams in there and then they get trapped and they can't get out. So with the unnetted pots, they would go in, eat clams and then get out. But the baby clams would float into the netted pots and grow and they couldn't get out, and that's why we could have. That's why we didn't mind. That's possibly why. <laughs> <laughs> Along your idea 
Yeah, and you guys are really lucky to work with Brian and Kyle. Um, have you thought about maybe monitoring the milky worms and the green crabs starting their planktonic life till they get to set? And are they setting in the pots or what's going on? I hate to give you extra work, but throughout the experiment, started it kind of with your throughout idea. The experiment we monitored. Um, only the time, we didn't monitor anything else, but there could be future implications on what we could do um, and what our next steps will be to conduct an experiment on whether or not it was, in fact, the progress of the life throughout the milky ribbon worms and the green crabs. Yes. But no, we did not conduct any experiments on that. I think these guys deserve another round of applause.